Hello. Good timing. That was really well orchestrated there as we unmuted ourselves at the same time. <clears throat> Uh, for for anyone who watched uh, the weekly space hangout on Friday, uh, I normally mute all the participants of the show and then I unmute them after that first five minutes and something broke. And so all the people that I unmuted didn't unmute. And so this time, I hope we have, well, we just used a different method. <laughs> synchronized our unmutings and so it wasn't relying on that technology so if anyone is not able to see Pamela this week please let me know and we will fix it somehow but I'm, uh, I'm not even sure how that would happen computers are stupid I hate technology what I don't understand well well part of that is is hard to understand um, so if you're wondering what on earth this is that you stumbled into, we're going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. Uh, it's going to be the last episode of our uh, ex you know, famous physics experiments series, which we've been doing for quite a while. And I really hope we've sort of fulfilled on the promise of this. And I have no idea what we're going to be doing next. Uh, we've I got a whole, don't either. We need no, to. No, we've got a that. huge list of topic ideas, and I know I can fill it with lots more ideas. So I think we'll spend a chunk of next week or this week actually uh, planning out the schedule for until the uh, the hiatus. So another another month's worth of episodes. Um, yeah. So this is a live uh, interactive uh, episode. So you can of course talk to us. Go ahead and put in any questions that you want in the Q and A app when you're wherever you're watching this video. Just click that we're interacting with the audience. There's a place where you can put in your questions and we will answer them at the end. Uh, so I'm going to say hi to Ilad Avron and Guido Bibra and Giselle Sabarin and Nancy Graziano and Michael Dahmer and Helga Bjorkog and Tony Lynch and Phil Wilcox and Tom Nathy and Peter Waldman, uh, Richard Stossel. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, just some of the names that are watching us today. So, hey, folks, thanks for joining us. How are you doing over there, Pamela? Is there anything we need to uh, promote? Blatantly Not that promote? I can Okay, great. Well, then we will just go right into the show. Uh, all right. Are you ready to record? I am. I am pressing record. It is recording in mono. I actually did it right this week. Nice. Hey, Preston. You're the best. Uh, okay, I'm also recording. Hey, Preston. All right. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 379, Fermi Splits the Atom. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I am doing very well. So, uh, you know what? I think I'm just going to, you know, normally we have something to kind of promote to the beginning of the show. I'm just going to promote two things. One, you should follow Pamela on Twitter. Her, her Twitter address is Starstrider with a Y. And then you should also follow me. I'm just F Kane, F C A I N. And uh, both incredibly interesting feeds, perhaps the, the most important Twitter feeds you could possibly follow on all of Twitter. So if you're a fan of Astronomy Cast, just connect with us. Give us some feedback, send us questions. We love it. That's it. Let's record, uh, let's do the episode. Sounds good. So when he wasn't puzzling the mystery of alien civilizations, Enrico Fermi was splitting atoms. He realized that when atoms were split, the neutrons released could go on and split other item, atoms, creating a chain reaction and the most powerful weapons ever devised. So this is going to be the final episode of our phys famous physics experiments. And uh, I think this is a, a pretty important one to wrap up on. So I think good call, Pamela, on on suggesting this one as the as the final episode. So I guess set the stage as always. Um, what was the landscape when we sort of last left our heroes? They were really identifying the interior of what the atom was and performing a bunch of experiments to, to figure out what the protons were, what the neutrons were. They had figured out what the electrons were. Where do they get to to think that maybe you could actually split these up and that you could get a lot of power out of this? Well, the amazing thing is when Fermi started his work, 
we didn't actually know that fission was a thing. The idea that you could split an atom, people hadn't gotten there yet. Um, in fact, it was one of those things that he kind of mentioned during his Nobel Prize acceptance. That, that was one of those things that he admitted during his Nobel Prize acceptance speech as a maybe we should have realized this already because he actually started splitting atoms before he knew he was splitting atoms. So how was he splitting atoms? So Enrico Fermi uh, realized that you could actually harness the power of the neutron to grow atoms. Uh, he was one of the first people to start working with beta decay as a way of getting to new parts of the periodic table that had up till then not been revealed. So working with a variety of different ways to bombard things with neutron neutrons, he started finding, okay, if you bombard this, what do you get? If you bombard this, what do you get? So, so let's sort of explain that a little deeper here. So let's say I've got something, a heavy atom, like a uranium, for example, or you know, radium or something, something at the high end of the, you know, the heavier atoms, we'll use uranium. And so the process of beta decay, what, what is that? So, so the idea is that it's possible for a neutron to decay into a proton and an electron. Um, and then you have to also, because of conservation and momentum, uh, give off a neutrino as well. And he was actually the person who first figured out, wait, we need this particle to compensate for momentum. So he figured out the idea of a neutrino. He predicted the neutrino like 60 years before they were finally seen, right? As, as one does. Yeah. Um, and uh, he also was one of the first people to systematically work his way through the periodic table, bombarding things with neutrons and looking to see when do you get alpha particles coming off? When do you get beta decay? What are the resulting child atoms? And it was through this process that he started to discover um, what are referred to as tr trans uranium atoms. These are the atoms that are beyond uranium on the periodic table. So if you take a, an atom of uranium and you smash it, or I guess you fire a neutron beam at it, and I don't know where he got all these neutrons from, these individual neutrons probably. Well, you, you can get them through a variety of different things that are giving off neutrons through okay. different radioactive processes. Okay, and so you're firing these neutrons at your uranium atom, and some of them are sticking, <coughs> right? And that yeah. they are, they are, they are sticking and they're colliding with a sometimes an electron right and you're getting another proton and you're then walking those atoms up the periodic table how far can you go well you don't always walk up in a straightforward manner that's one of the the crazy things about this and there's an amazing table of nucleotides that's in the background of the big bang theory and is in almost every um physics department somewhere that actually shows you all the crazy chains that you can walk through. Um, and usually these are processes that you go down and go up in different steps. So for instance, um, I'm going to start with, a, with uranium since that was your example. So you have uranium and it undergoes a alpha decay it gives off an alpha particle it ends up then becoming thorium you bombard but it'll just that do that on its own right like it's just gonna yeah. give uranium enough time and it's gonna give off an, an alpha particle and another name for an alpha particle right is helium helium yeah so it's gonna give off that alpha particle and then it's gonna turn into thorium so just then that thorium undergoes a beta decay so one of its neutrons has now become a proton this bumps it up the periodic table. Um, now, the one that I'm looking at is calling it protactinium is the intermediate step that it has it at. And then this can undergo another beta decay to end up back at uranium. Um, that can then undergo another alpha decay to become a different version of thorium, which can undergo alpha decay to radium. 
um, all of these different processes, you basically go up and down via beta decay, inverse beta decay, and giving off alpha particles. Um, everything that we that we deal with that isn't stable is either going to decay through some sort of a beta process or through some sort of an alpha process um, for the most part. Okay, so I can just imagine Fermi, uh, and we've talked about Fermi, we talked about the Fermi paradox, but but this is sort of the other side of it, right? Of just about the, specifically about this. I can imagine he's in some lab, he is bombarding elements with all of these, these neutrons, but but where did he get this idea that there was there was more to this, right? That there was a power source, that there was a weapon here. Well, he didn't initially go straight to power source. He didn't initially go straight to weapon. What he went to was the realization that if you bombarded uranium with neutrons, the process that would proceed to go on where uranium actually broke down, um, would end up producing more neutrons than went into this. So the idea was that if you bombarded uranium with N neutrons, you ended up getting N plus some number of neutrons coming out. So if that uranium you bombarded was surrounded by more uranium, then perhaps those excess neutrons could go on to trigger more uranium to break down, which would then release more neutrons. And so his initial thought was that you could get a self-perpetuating process going on where the uranium was giving off neutrons. It would keep this process going on its own. Right. And if you just packed the uranium close enough so that the enough of the neutrons would would reach another atom of uranium and split it off and, and, and keep going, as long as you could keep uranium localized around where that chain reaction was happening, you would get a, a powerful energy release. But and I mean, did they really understand like the, the no. scale, right? I mean, no. I mean, the, the crazy thing is, is as I was reading through this, it, it starts out, he, he's in Rome, he's doing his work in Rome, nothing truly terrible is happening. He's getting neutron sources in glass jars shipped to him from other countries. He's releasing the neutrons and watching the processes going on. And um, he was discovering new atoms. It was cool. Um, no one quite realized how bad radiation was at this point. Um, but the fact that he started discovering, well, in all, he re induced radioactivity in 22 new elements while he was working in Italy. And this led to the Nobel Prize, which was actually quite literally a lifesaver for him and his family, quite quite potentially. Um, his wife was Jewish. This was the beginning of um, World War II. And so when he got the Nobel Prize, he took his entire family with him to Stockholm to receive the prize. And then conveniently flew, well, he didn't fly, but then conveniently traveled, not from Stockholm back to Italy, but from Stockholm to New York City. And so I went, okay, can anyone offer me a job? And so this, having just received a Nobel Prize, physicist saying, can someone please give me a job, promptly had five different universities offer him professorships. And um, he accepted a job at Columbia in New York City, where he'd previously been a summer lecturer. So he went from Rome where he was working with neutron sources and radioactive elements to um, Columbia where he's now in New York City. And he starts collecting uranium on the seventh floor of the building he was working in. And he actually ended up with several tons of uranium. And I'm not sure what disturbs me most about this. The fact that he was looking to potentially start building a nuclear reactor in New York City, or the fact that he had several tons of stuff piled up on the seventh floor of a fairly old building in New York City. Um, there was all kinds of, of not exactly safe stuff going on when it came to watching Fermi's research. So this was the next step of, of him right on 
So then when did that transition to getting involved on the Manhattan Project? Because, you know, he had, he had left Italy, received his Nobel Prize, uh, left, left Italy in 38, um, and Got was to able to... In 39. 39, was able to get into, and just as war really broke out, and, and he was, you know, and then how did that transition into getting involved on the Manhattan Project? It, it was one of these things where he was one of the early scientists who began to realize that all of this is a process that can give off tremendous amounts of energy and that fission is actually part of what's going on. It wasn't until 1939 that they actually realized fission of atoms was an actual process. What, what Enrico Fermi had seen that he was doing up until then was he was building bigger and bigger atoms by bombarding things with neutrons. The fact that some of the atoms he was building um, were actually fragments, new isotopes that were smaller atoms didn't immediately become clear to him. And so it was um, in 1939 that he began to find out that people at other universities were starting to do, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing on now four different devices. I'm not quite sure what I did so wrong to deserve that happening. <laughs> Apologize to Preston. Okay. Okay, sorry, Preston. That was just kind of insane. Um, somebody really wants okay. to get a hold of you. Somebody really wanted to get a hold of me. Um, okay, so let me start that thought over. I'm sorry, Preston. Um, so up until then, Enrico Fermi hadn't fully understood that what he was doing was both building larger atoms and sometimes splitting larger atoms into smaller atoms through fission processes. But in 1939, as other people began doing similar work, as other people began working to try and understand what they were doing a little bit better, it became clearer and clearer that this was actually a fission process, that by breaking apart larger atoms, you could actually uh, get energy released and get smaller atoms. This was a new idea. If you think about it, um, as we discussed in, in earlier Hangouts, when you fuse together atoms up to um, iron, but not beyond iron, um, you get energy released. So now we're talking about energy being released with the fission of bigger atoms. When they realized what they were doing, they wrote to what would eventually become the Department of Energy saying, look, here's this thing we figured out. It was sort of a warning and sort of a, can we have money for research all tied together? And in fact, Fermi was able to turn this into getting $1,500 to uh, continue working on trying to build a fission pile. Um, but they still didn't fully understand what they had on their hands at this point. Right. And as you said, he had been stockpiling uranium on the seventh floor of the building. Uh, but I know that the, you know, the folks in who were, you know, the government, they were leading the war effort. They reached out to, uh, to Fermi and, and his team and looked about how they could potentially weaponize it. And I highly recommend if you look for a thing called Chicago Pile 1. If you want to look for a picture, this is the uh, this is the the pile. Pile is the, it's such a funny term, yeah. right? Because it's it's a pile of uranium and surrounded by graphite, um, but it is and it also had graphite in inside of it as well to moderate the reaction. Right, but uh, this is the uh, this is sort of the first uh, self sustaining nuclear reaction that they actually started to create. Right, they they took it to that next step, demonstrated. That you could <clears throat> you could make these things chain, and that and that I guess that's when they figured out this could be a bomb. So so it it started in 1939 with Enrico Fermi basically giving a lecture to the Navy Department and saying, "Look, here's here's what the concept of nuclear energy is. 
They gave him $1,500 to continue his research, which I find kind of amusing. Um, I thought it was worth $20 million back in 1939. Not quite. It still no. wasn't a huge amount for research, but um, it, it bought a fair amount of graphite. Um, and and then from there, he, it was he and many, many other famous scientists that ended up writing a letter to the president saying, you need to be aware this kind of discovery will lead to the Nazis trying to produce nuclear bombs. That was the start of the Manhattan Project. Um, Enrico Fermi was part of the Manhattan Project. He was able to spend most of his time staying up at Chicago, working up there, um, where he proceeded to start nuclear reactions under football stadiums. Um, but uh, his primary role in a lot of this was the person doing the calculations to figure out if you have this much of this and this much of this, you end up with this kind of an output. He, he was the calculation man. Um, while he was at Columbia, he managed to amass six tons of uranium oxide, 30 tons of graphite, and then he took all of this with him to the University of Chicago, where he eventually started producing um, self-perpetuating reactions. But he did actually start doing nuclear reactions in New York City. So it may be good that he wasn't spending most of his time at Manhattan, because he did just kind of put things together to see if they would radiate. Now, do you, I mean, do you think that he had something that was dangerous when he was building it in Chicago? Um, I think he had something that was dangerous when he was building it in New York City. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, so initially he was building nuclear reactions that were mediated by water. Water is a strong absorber of neutrons. If you flush water through a uranium pile, um, the neutrons that are released uh, through the fission process are mostly going to get absorbed by the water, so you're not going to end up with a self-perpetuating reaction. But if that water somehow leaks out, if you don't have enough water, if the water evaporates, um, you can end up with a critical reaction, one that can't be stopped once it's started. Um, that luckily didn't happen. But nonetheless, this is someone who had several tons of uranium salts in New York City. Not something I would generally recommend. Right. Um, when, when he went to Chicago, uh, they initially said, maybe we shouldn't do this reaction in Chicago. And they were originally going to do it out in um, the Argonne Woods, where Argonne National Labs is currently located. They ran into some problems with the construction crew, plans. It, it just didn't end up happening. And somehow he managed to convince someone that while it wasn't safe to do this in the metallurgy building, uh, he wasn't in the Department of Physics at this point, he was in the Department of Metallurgy, um, that it was somehow safe to do it underground in what some reports say is a squash court and others say is a volleyball court underneath the football field. Right. <laughs> Which, again, if that had gotten out of control, would have, uh, you know, would have made for, I guess, well, a super powered mutant football team. Which would have been interesting to watch. Or something. Um, or something. So then, I mean, you know, then I, at this point, I think the Army started to realize what they had in their hands and they started to develop the Manhattan Project. And how did that sort of lead up to the final development of the? Well, this the was bombs? all happening at the same time as as the Manhattan Project, so so there there were lots of things going on simultaneously all across the United States that were feeding into the Manhattan Project. Um, so it was in 1942 that his um, Chicago pile number one went critical. Um, All of this was leading up to, to building the nuclear bomb. Um, I have to admit, I didn't prep on the nuclear bomb, so I'm kind of looking things up live while we record this. That's okay. Pardon me if I screw up any of the dates. Um, so We can actually talk more about sp uh, splitting atoms if you want. Yeah, I wasn't prepared to. Sure, no, it's okay. 
it's just sort Sorry. of a natural. And you know me, I want to talk about <coughs> things blowing up and and such. So it's just a should have should have anticipated this, Pamela. Uh, so so then, where are we at with modern physics then about this process? I mean, you know, splitting atoms, putting them together, and we've got these great tools now, right? The Large Hadron Collider, things like that. You know, what is the process these days? Well, with the Large Hadron Collider, that that's actually a different area of physics. That's trying to generate new particles by um, creating a large pocket of energy in a very small volume that will hopefully, uh, in the process of going from energy to mass, create something new and exciting to study. But what we're able to do following on with Enrico Fermi's work is a lot of um, the nucleotides that we use in medical research are actually produced through these neutron bombardment processes. So if, for instance, you need one of the um, nuclear capsules that they embed inside of different cancerous tumors, if you need the um, radioactive splinters that they may um, use to treat uh, brain tumors, all of these are produced by taking one kind of isotope and knowing that if you bombard it with neutrons, you're going to take that one known type of isotope and change its identity into something that has a energy output that will kill off cancer cells. So we're essentially using the science started by Enrico Fermi to treat cancer. So you never know what basic research is going to end up actually leading to. In this case, you had someone that um, was afraid for a while that his research was leading to the hydrogen bomb, but it also led to one way to treat cancer. Um, and also the hydrogen bomb. Also the hydrogen bomb. Yeah, I mean, um, that happened too. Radiothermal generators, RTGs that we use in spacecraft, these are again something that are built up by changing the type of isotope that you're dealing with inside of a breeder reactor. So lots and lots of processes were essentially bombarding things with neutrons, changing their identity in the process, and getting something really useful out the other side. And what is the state of the art? Because I know that that scientists are still looking for they're using Fermi's original methods to go further and further up the the uh, the list of elements, and the amount of time that these things last is shorter and shorter and shorter. But hopefully, the goal is maybe to find a whole new class of elements that are stable again, right? There, there's some theory that leads to the notion that perhaps somehow you can find a second island of stability. Now, there's absolutely no observational evidence to say this should be true. When we look out across the universe, we don't see any atoms that can't be explained. And at the end of the day, there is no um, more effective uh, neutron bombardment system than a supernova. So while there are theories that say that there may be another island of stability if you build atoms that are large enough, um, a lot of us are very skeptical of this actually being the situation. Um, another reason to be skeptical skeptical about this is uh, gluons, the, the boson that holds together the nuclei. It only has a very short distance over which it's able to exert its pull together of, of protons that would otherwise much rather repel one another apart. And um, we're sort of hitting the limit at which gluons can even temporarily, well, essentially glue protons together. Right, so, I see. So it's almost like the, the radius of the, the nucleus itself is so big that the gluons really just can't hold. It, exactly. It's, it's sort of like there, there is a limit to the size of a sphere I can hold with my arms. If a sphere gets bigger than that, there's nothing for my arms to curve around because my arms just aren't large enough. Well, it's it's not the exact same problem, but it's a similar problem in trying to hold together. Right, but nuclei. in this case, the the individual protons, the spheres that you're trying to hold, are all trying to push away from each other. Exactly. Right, and so that's the trick is that you can imagine if you've got like you know three or four spheres, you can kind of hold them into your arms and hold them all together. But you get to a certain point, you just can't hold them, and they just keep falling away. So as they're all pushing away, um, and so but then that but 
but I guess the trick is, is that they, they bombard these things with the neutrons, build up a bigger element, and then watch how that element splits apart to determine new pathways, you know, the new kinds of math. I mean, being a particle physicist is a whole career that it, you can it, go into. Ex exactly. And one of the really cool things about this is um, we are trying to basically prove our theoretical understanding of how things will decay um, by looking for actual evidence that this is the decay pathway that things take. If you get that amazing nucleotides poster that, that I mentioned, um, there are theoretical pathways through it and there are observed pathways through it. And a lot of the theoretical ones are based on looking to see what is the ratio of child isotopes, um, looking at the energies involved, and doing calculations of this is most likely what's going to happen. But it's even more cool when you can bombard something with the neutrons and then actually look to see how it decays. Right. And so if you were a potential particle physicist, you could make a whole career out of just proving one of the links or a couple of those pathways in the chains that are just theoretical or disproving them. Exactly. Either way. Cool. Well, thanks, Fermi. Thanks for everything. Thanks for the power and not thanks for the weapons. I think we will hand those back. But but the accidental discovery of a cure for cancer is something I'll take any day of the week. Yeah, exactly. And a way to power spacecraft like Voyager so they can last for 50 years. That's pretty awesome. Yes. Cool. Well, that wraps up the uh, our, I don't even know how many part series on, on physics experiments. And uh, so next week, we're going to talk about something completely different. So thanks, Pema. Thank you, Fraser. All right, save. You're going to kill me. You didn't record your end? It stopped recording 14 minutes in. We can pull the audio for the last half from the YouTube video. We can. That is true. That is the backup. Okay. From your side. My side <laughs> will sound crystal clear. <laughs> why it did that because what part of i hate technology it's all stupid <laughs> was, was unclear there because i mean this we're just one step away from the robot uprising like this is the technology will I misbehave and then it will enslave us all and use our atoms for computronium I bet that was one of those Apple auto try and do things nice for you things that when my phone started ringing on my computer, it was like, oh, I'll stop this recording while you answer your phone. Yeah. Go ahead and get to your phone. You, Apple. <laughs> Whoa. We're going to have to put a, <laughs> Sorry. A, a explicit <laughs> lyrics on this one. Um, uh, interesting side note, Pamela swears like a sailor. Um, all right, let's get to some questions. What say you? Unless you're done, not done raging at your technology. I'm done raging. Um, so Preston may want to, I guess, want a quick intro from you where you briefly yeah, no, your audio true. shifts to something sub quality later yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll actually append that to that audio file. I am uploading my episode, so we're set. Okay, so uh, Elad Avron notes, hey guys, I just watched the ISS fly by and I'm ecstatic. Also, I need to get better binoculars. Uh, that wasn't a question, but uh, we appreciate your enthusiasm. Cool thing about ISS is that you can see the TIE fighter shape in a pair of binoculars. And I don't know about you, but I get so many people telling me that like, I don't know, like space doesn't exist. I get all these crazy emails from the from the cranks, right? That space doesn't, that we're not launching spacecraft, that it's all just a big hoax and a scam. But grab a pair of binoculars and watch ISS. And you're seeing ISS. Like, you like you know how yeah. binoculars work to see things? Well, you can look up the sky and just see the space station go past. There, there are people that think that, like, we don't have satellites. Yes. Yes. Wow. Or that okay. the moon is a hologram, or that the Earth is flat, or that the moon is hollow. Have you, have you not? The, 
Man, we are not no, in the I same just get circles here. Letters. No, no, we just get different trolls. I get trolled because I'm a girl. You get tro right. trolled because you believe in science. Right. Yeah. And but we both get death threats for it. Yes. Isn't that crazy? My girlfriend can't believe that I get death threats when I talk about, you know, yes, we landed on the moon. <sighs> okay. Um, Steve Chisel proposes that you have a lack of disk space, but no, we've, we've got to the bottom of the problem. Yeah, no, it was my phone ringing. Uh, Steve also notes, wasn't there a natural nuclear reactor that existed at some point? Yeah, under South yes. Africa. Yeah. That was really cool. Yeah, which is so terrifying that some portion of the ground, if you've got the uranium packed close enough together, can just go off like a nuclear reactor. I think it's cool. Sure. Someone's cool is someone else's terrifying. It's true. I'm also not afraid of spiders. Uh, or natural nuclear reactors. <laughs> um, all right. So Guido asks, what happened to the Astronomy Cast logo? I only see the familiar microphone in the round circle. Weird. I don't know. I'm not, I can't be technical support for the whole, for all of Google. I don't know what's going on. You can let me know yeah. what you're seeing, Guido. Uh, that'd be great. Um, one thing is, is that we, when we switch to the, the YouTube, like we're using Astronomy Cast YouTube channel. We're not using uh, my personal YouTube channel anymore. And so I log in as Astronomy Cast. I don't log in as, as Fraser Kane. And you do the same, right? So we're both actually logged in as Astronomy Cast right now. And then the video gets dropped into the astronomy cast page so that's why we have but maybe i didn't click my icon and i it was just went to yours i'm not sure anyway okay uh polygon says hi from florida pictures frozen on pamela is this still true i don't know okay um guido says oh the audio quality in the hangout is actually so good that'll be no that'll be hardly noticeable in the podcast yeah that's that's why we both use nice microphones yep for the backup uh this is that's why i didn't freak out when we lost half of our audio i'm like meh we'll use the backup um let's see uh, Steve's got all kinds of great uh, comments here. So fun fact, today marks the 50th anniversary of the molten salt reactor experiment, first being switched on at the Oak Ridge National Lab. So there you go. Uranium salt. Uranium salt. Every time I hear molten salt, I'm like, why would you do that to table salt? And then I have to remember that salt is just a chemical term, not restricted to food. Thomas Tranecker says that there was a power reactor in Stockholm City under the technical high school soccer field. What, what, what is it about putting nuclear reactors underneath sports fields? They are trying to build the Avengers. Yeah. Uh, well, see, Richard Strassel says the world would have gone very different if they had developed super mutant football players. See? That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Um... Some people are recommending some books. So Tom Nathy recommends The Making of the Atomic Bomb. This is an excellent read for the history of the atomic bomb. That sounds great. I'm, I'm feeling fascinated by this process, and I think I would like to read into it more. Or maybe we can do an episode on the Manhattan Project once I've, once I've read up on it. Um, what else? There's a good opera about the Manhattan Project, and I can't remember the name of it, so that wasn't the most useful information I've ever shared. Um, is it Zombie Prom? No. That's set to uh, Enrico Fermi High School? No. This vision is part of the story, provided, proved by the song Johnny Don't Go to the Nuclear Plant? No? Okay. This is Steve Chisel is, is suggesting all of these. Um, okay, great. Well, then I am going to draw, if, if we don't have any more questions there, I'm going to draw from the big old list of questions that have been sent to us. So I think it's Dr. Atomic is the name of the opera I'm thinking of. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so uh, 
friend of ours, uh, Matus Macias, who uh, works in, oh, he's he's been sending us questions every week and uh, been posting the the results. But uh, but he asked this question. I don't know if you got a chance to get back to him, which was if you could go for a vacation wherever you wanted in our solar system, what destination would you pick and why, and who would you take with you? So Pamela, where would you go? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, right now, I I probably would do a staycation simply because the idea of traveling is so overwhelming. Um, but I don't think that's the type of answer he's looking for. Yeah. Um, if I could send a robot to do the travel with me, so I wouldn't have to deal with jet lag and germs from airports, um, it would probably be to the moons of Jupiter which one all of them just sort of like you go to the hawaiian islands and you jump right? between islands i would be pretty amazing if you could somehow remain safe like to just well, I, I think in general if you can remain safe is an issue with all of these worlds sure. yeah absolutely. you're dealing Let's with just... plasma belts and everything from jupiter yeah. i'd like to go to titan and then you could fly with your own arm power through the thick atmosphere and the light gravity, that would be pretty great. So, you know, uh, here people go scuba diving or kite sailing. There you could go flying, which would be pretty neat. Um, I would like, to, you know, for something more relaxing, go to the Cloud City on Venus and and hang out. In the sulfuric the, acid. In the sulfuric acid, you know, again, as you mentioned, remaining safe. Yep. Um, I would like to climb the, the weird ridge, the equatorial ridge on Iapetus. Which would, be pretty, would be cool. which would be pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then maybe go skating on uh, on Europa, on some fresh ice on Europa. That would be great. Um, let's see, what else have we got? <coughs> so uh, this comes from Yasha Sawini V. Uh, I want to, how to get into space work. I want to get into NASA. I love space, but how? So Pamela, how? Can so, a person work for NASA? Well, NASA probably isn't the right place to be going right now because they're they actually hire contractors to do the work for them. So if you as a human being want to be doing the work, you want to go find who NASA is contracting um, and then go work for one of the contractors. So that's one of those dark, deep little secrets that most okay, people so, don't realize. So hold on a second here. So so you're saying that that people when they say they work for NASA. They don't they actually, actually work. work for a contractor. They actually work for so so. Give me an example of a contractor then. So the Lunar and Planetary Institute down in Houston, a lot of the people who work there have NASA.gov email addresses, but their paycheck comes from the Lunar and Planetary Institute, which is a private institute that is funded through a cooperative agreement notice. Um, Right. So it, it's not actually a NASA facility the way the Jet Propulsion Lab is. But even actually Jet Propulsion Lab is also a contractor the way Goddard is. Yeah. So Goddard is a NASA facility. But even if you work at Goddard, you probably are working at Goddard but working for a contractor. Right, MS. You're working for... Um like Baltimore, there's yeah, there's a bunch, right? Yeah, there's a whole lot of different yeah. contractors. And so look at like, uh, and so you'll have a contractor that will build the spacecraft. And so, uh, you know, so that can be like a Boeing or a uh, Lockheed Martin or... Um, I think those are now the same company. Sorry, uh, the, but in the stuff out of Europe, in the aerospace, right? So there's a bunch of of spacecraft manufacturers, and then there's sort of the the science and the operations of the spacecraft. And so you have things like, um, you know, you mentioned uh, Goddard. Uh, there's uh, J. John Hopkins. Uh, there's um, Southwest Research Institute South is one of the big ones. Yep. Um, so the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins, Southwest Research Institute, which is in both San Antonio and Colorado. Yeah. Um, you have, uh, there, there's so many. There's the Planetary Science Institute in Arizona. Yeah. Lots of people working at universities have all of their funding coming from NASA, but they're not actually NASA employees. They just work off NASA funding. And so, what if you're... You're not a 
uh, if you're not an American, what if you're a Canadian like me? And I think, Doesn't you know, matter. it's just restricts on, it puts some restrictions on what you're allowed to work with. There's what's called ITAR, um, which is, um, a form of international restrictions on what people from different nations are able to work on. This sometimes leads to some bizarre cases where there was, uh, one researcher I spoke with who was, um, uh, of Indian nationality working in the United States um, research university. And the project he was working on that was his project had been f funded for him to do it. Uh, partway through the execution of the project, the restrictions changed and suddenly he was no longer allowed into his own research lab, but his US born students were the ones who had to continue doing his research. Right. Um, so you do have strange things that occur um, that are somewhat at the whim of um, the U.S. Congress, but for the most part, being an international isn't a problem. But let's say that you wanted to, I guess, pick your education, pick your your career path, and you really want to get into into space exploration. What should you focus on? That, I mean, the, the truth is that nowadays space exploration requires people from all fields. Uh, well, maybe not music, but there are people who are musicians who work uh, in parallel with space exploration and are still funded through science money to work on science, technology, arts, engineering, and music projects. Uh, these are the STEAM projects. Um, but for the most part, uh, lawyers work on space policy. We have mechanical engineers, optical engineers, computer scientists, electrical engineers, uh, physicists, astronomers, biologists, medical doctors, uh, meteorologists. I could keep going. It, yeah. It's literally pretty much every single field is needed at some level. Um, the highest numbers of jobs are going to be in the engineering fields simply because somebody has to build and maintain the spacecraft. And and then the, the places that you can get the jobs are all of those different uh, different spacecraft manufacturers. So there's the military ones, there's the commercial there's the commercial ones, and, and there are manufacturers in different countries. There's the private ones, there's the public ones. You could be in Europe, you can be in India even. Yeah. There's the space the space ISRO in India, Japan, China, all these places are all building spacecraft. Uh, and so you can you can work for any one of these firms when they need your kind of specific expertise. So yeah. uh, you know the best I would say the best thing to do as you're designing your career is to go and look before you like go through your career, look at the kinds of job openings that are opening up in different kinds of companies. What is Boeing looking for? What is Lockheed Martin looking for? What is ATK looking for? Uh, all the different contractors and see the kinds of job openings that they have a lot of. And if you're interested in doing that kind of engineering, that kind of mechanical engineering, that kind of, you know, then start to take the kinds of courses and build, prepare yourself to be able to do that. And but, then while you're at it, the key part is do what you're interested in because the probabilities of getting a job in space are so low. You want to pick something that even if you're not working in space, you're going to enjoy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why we always recommend, I mean, really what? Mechanical engineering and computer programming. Like those are so applicable to space exploration, but they're also great careers and there's tons of jobs. And even if you don't end up in uh with a firm you can still get lots of work as a computer programmer right right as opposed to being a musician right if you're going to try and become the composer for the background music of the of all of the various missions that's a possibility but it's pretty tough but but it's funny like one of one of my friends uh is a computer programmer and, and did a bunch of of visualization for us on some of our videos and now he's working for jpl to, yeah. to work on their visualizations department. So, you know, it's all, it's, you can almost work on anything. It's amazing, as you said. So do what you love and just keep working on space related projects as best you can. Would you say it's almost more important to, with it's the context that you make and the friends that you make and the connections and the yeah. opportunities and the ways you volunteer your time and get involved in projects? Volunteering is, is almost never useful. Um, it, it's the 
internships you get, which should be paid if you're in the sciences. Um, if, if you're volunteering your time, someone is probably taking advantage of you. Um, so what matters most is who you know, who can write you rec letters, and what you can put down as paid positions you've had in the past. And unfortunately, statistically, what matters most is actually, are you a white male? Um, so it's, it's a complicated field out there right now. Yeah. But I mean, even the stuff that I've done, you know, we've, we've, had, we've done whole episodes on this as well, but you know, in my case, I'm completely independent, totally disconnected from, from you know, I'm not, uh, reliant on jumping through any of those hoops. I've just been able to do my own thing and be able to participate in the process. So if you love it enough and you're willing to put in the time and energy, you can, you can even be outside of the official system as well and still have a career in this. Right. And the things that I've been able to do and the things that I've been able to see and be a part of are amazing. I am, however, a white male. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that really goes against that, uh, that system. But the point is that nobody has ever told me what I can and can't do. Right, right? whereas nobody I can't has, what I can't do on a daily basis. On a daily basis, so, exactly. Yeah. And that's sort of the difference, right? So, uh, um. Elad Avron says, I'm hoping to get into space exploration through computer science, image processing. That sounds great. Yeah, There's that's a real way to go in. Go tons into of people it. in image processing. Even on what we do with CosmoQuest, right, Pamela? With all of yeah. the people who are are looking through the images that we have on the on the server to try, you know, there's a lot of work to create the computer programs that allow that level of, of image processing and comparing. So that's great. Uh, see if any more questions. Um, any more questions? Does anybody want us to? So Steve uh, Chisnell sent out a video on molten salt reactor, which I'm going to retweet. So anyone who's interested in that, uh, go ahead and look for it on my feed. I'm at Star Strider with a Y on Twitter. As what we've mentioned. Uh, Steve, Steve, Steve has been is got lots to say today. Uh, I trust that we're both fans of XKCD, of yeah. course. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I think we can we can wrap this up then. Uh, so, thanks, Pamela. My pleasure, and Fraser. Thank you, everybody, for watching us. Uh, well, I've got a few more minutes. I'm going to promote a couple of communities while we're here. Um, so if you haven't already, go to cosmoquest.org slash forum. And this is the venerable forum that uh, that has been running for 15 years now, all about space and astronomy and is, has- 17 years. 17 years, yeah. It's been all about space and astronomy. Almost old enough to vote. Oh, don't, don't let it vote. <laughs> Um, so if you want to join a huge community of people, uh, another one, of course, is the WSH crew. This is the, this is the folks that, uh, that are really the producers of the weekly space hangout and they choose the guests, they choose the stories and we all just show up and talk about what they want to hear. So if you want to, if you love the space stuff and you want to really direct and create a show where you want to be a part of it check out the WSH crew on Google plus just do a search for WSH crew on, on Google and you'll find it. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks Pamela for joining me once again. I am terrified and excited that we're all out of topics and now we need to pick some more. So uh, we'll get cracking. Sounds good. Fraser. All right. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye.